Summary of the Return of Martin Gare by Natalie Zeman Davis Natalie Zeman Davis is a historian who starts by talking about why she chose to write The Return of Martin Gare, a book about a famous case of impersonation in a French town in the 1600s. The story has been told many times in movies, plays, and pop culture, but Davis wanted to write about it from the point of view of a scholar, looking at what it can teach us about life in the countryside in the 1600s. She was also interested in the case because it was about the private and emotional lives of peasants instead of aristocratic people, who were usually the focus of written stories in the 1600s. Davis sees a mixing of high and low culture in the way that people are interested in the story of Martin Guerre. He was born into a Basque family that lived on the line between France and Spain. His father, Sanchi the Older, moved his brother Pierre, his wife, and their son to a village called Artigat in the southwest of France in 1527. He left the family property behind. The Daguerres got used to their new home by learning about the society there. Instead of their old name, they changed it to Guerre and learned the Occitan language that was spoken there. It looks like they were able to fit in because in 1538, Martin married Bertrand de Rolls, who was from a wealthy family in the area and brought a large dowry with her. It's likely that Martin and Bertrand were in their early teens when they got married. Martin and Bertrand did not do what they promised to do for eight years after they got married, until they had a son named Sanchi the Younger. Martin wasn't happy where he lived and wanted to get away from it all. Martin was charged with stealing some grain from his father when he was 24 years old. Basque society doesn't accept theft, so Martin left his family and inheritance behind and ran away from the village. He left his home country of France and went to Spain to fight as a soldier for Spain against France. Martin was shot during a battle in 1557 and had to have his leg cut off and replaced with a wooden one. At the same time, Bertrand, who had been left alone, had to depend on the kindness of her male cousins. According to church law, a wife could not marry again until there was solid proof that her husband had died. This meant that she was neither a wife nor a widow. It had been almost 10 years since Martin had last been seen. In 1556, a guy named Arnaud du Till came to Artigat and said he was Martin. He was born in a village not far away. He loved gambling and drinking, and because he ate so much, people called him Pancet, which means the belly. When he heard that Martin had left, he decided to pretend to be the missing man and steal his stuff. He learned as much as he could about Martin's family and life to get ready for the lie. Davis says he's like a fair performer wearing a mask. Bertrand and his family didn't know him at first, but when he told them stories from 10 or 15 years ago, which he probably learned from Martin's neighbors, they believed him. Davis says that this makes more sense than it does. After all, Martin hadn't been seen by the Gares in almost 10 years, and they didn't have any paintings of him to remember him by. There's no doubt that Bertrand was fooled at first, but she must have known at some point that this wasn't her husband. Davis says that Bertrand and Arnaud fell in love, and that he kept up the lie that he was Martin Guerre with her permission and help. They were married and lived together for three years, having a daughter named Bernard. But things went wrong when Arnaud got into a fight with Martin's uncle Pierre over who should run the family farm. Arnaud started to buy, sell, and rent out land, including the family homes in Basque country, France. He also asked Pierre to look at the elder Sanchi's old bank records. When Pierre said no, Arnaud sued him in civil court. To get back at him, Pierre started saying that this man wasn't really his nephew and was just a fake. Pierre took Arnaud to court for pretending to be Martin Guerre and abusing his wife by pretending to be her husband. Even though Bertrand didn't give her permission, he filed the case in her name. In 1560, Arnaud was caught and put on trial at Rose. Bertrand was afraid that Pierre would kick her out of the house if she didn't agree to speak for the prosecution. She did so, even though she hoped she would lose the case. Bertrand loved Arnaud but she also had to look out for herself. She wanted her son to inherit and for her image as a good woman to stay strong, which she couldn't do if she was called an adulteress. Davis tells the court that they had a tough job to do. In the past, 
before fingerprinting, photos, and birth records, it was almost impossible to prove identity fraud. The court called 150 witnesses. Some swore the man was Arnaud, some swore he was Martin, and some said the two men looked alike because they couldn't decide which one was which. Since no one had seen Martin in 10 years, everyone had a different idea of what he looked like. In the end, the case went to a higher court in Toulouse. There, too, the evidence wasn't clear-cut, even Martin's close cousins couldn't agree on whether Arnaud was really Martin or not. It looked like the court would rule in favor of the offender more and more. It was known that Bertrand was a good woman, and she said that Arnaud was her husband. Pierre seemed to have a grudge against his son-in-law and wasn't a reliable witness. But just as the court was about to decide in Arnaud's favor, a man with a wooden leg showed up in Toulouse and said he was Martin Guerre. Martin lost a leg in battle and was then made a lay brother in a rich Spanish monastery that aristocrats liked. He did choose to return to Artigat, though. Davis thinks Martin found out about the trial and went back home to get his family, property, and name back. Since the Real Martin came back, Arnaud was shown to be a fake. Pierre and Martin's sisters quickly figured out who Martin was and begged him to forgive them. Bertrand hugged him and told him she was sorry for what she did. She said Arnaud had tricked and seduced her. Martin, on the other hand, told her in a harsh voice that a wife should know her husband. Arnaud was told he had to do punishment in public in Artigat and then he would be hang. However, his daughter Bernard was recognized as legal and was given his property because Bertrand was said not to have known how her daughter was born. He was hung in front of the Gare's house and died saying that Bertrand was innocent, honest, and good. Two layers, Jean de Corus and Guillaume Le Sur, started writing their story of what happened after the trial. Le Sur's book about the case, Ad Miranda Historia, which came out in 1561, is a simple news pamphlet that just sums up what happened and ends with a good lesson. Chorus's arrest memorable, 1561, is more creative because it focuses on the story and the people in it instead of the law facts. Chorus seemed to like Arnaud too, he called the story a tragedy for this fine peasant. Davis says that is not normal because only noble people are usually in French tragedies. The fact that Chorus could think of the case as a tragedy shows that he could see a big story in even the most ordinary people. The famous essayist Michel de Montaigne also wrote about the case and made an important point, the judge did not have the power to condemn Arnaud and sentence him to death with such weak proof. There was a lot of question in the minds of both Chorus and Montaigne about Martin Guerre. At the same time, things seemed to be back to normal in the town. Martine and Bertrand got along again and had two more kids. For many generations, the Guerre and de Rolle's families were close friends and helped each other. But people wouldn't forget about the case so quickly. No doubt Bertrand would never forget her time with Arnaud, and the locals would tell the story for many years to come. About the author Natalie Zemlin Davis was born in Detroit, Michigan. Her groundbreaking work in the fields of cultural and social history drew attention to the roles of women, low-status people, and other figures who are often forgotten or pushed to the side. She mostly writes about early modern Europe in her history books. The Return of Martin Guerre, one of her most famous books, is thought to be one of the first microhistories stories about the past that focus on the lives of specific people or groups instead of big historical stories. She used to teach at Princeton University, Brown University, the University of Toronto, and the University of California, Berkeley. She was 94 years old when she died on October 21, 2023. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.